jump scares when it comes down to it are pretty predictable. They have a rigid structure and once you know it, they don't really work on you anymore. So here's a quick breakdown. You're minding your own business in a game when suddenly you get the sense that nothing has tried to kill you recently. You're lured into a false sense of security with a chance to catch your breath, but now it's quiet, too quiet. You could hear a pin drop. And then, when you're least expecting it, loud noises and maybe some flashing lights. Oh no, and then it's over and you can go about your gaming experience again. Jump scares are boring. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. So when horror games manage to freak me out without resorting to them, I definitely take notice. No matter what kind of terrors we seek out, we all turn to horror games for the same thing. When you get down to it, horror games simulate our fears and help us overcome them. In a way, they create a sense of relief. But how? Well, it's actually a pretty basic psychology principle. Our brains create two stress-related chemicals when we play horror games, cortisol and dopamine. Cortisol gets produced over time while we feel tensed up and on edge, sneaking away from danger. And on the other hand, dopamine gets pumped into our system during action-packed chase sequences. Different types of horror experiences help our brain create different amounts of cortisol and dopamine when done right. When we really get invested in these worlds, our brains forget that we're playing through a simulation. They can be tricked into thinking we're in real mortal danger pretty easily. While jump scares hinge almost solely on a quick startle, most memorable horror media successfully capitalizes on the space between tension and release. There is no terror in the bang, only in the anticipation of it. When it comes to the subgenre of psychological horror, the fear is born out of that anticipation, the slow burn. We might be sneaking through a spaceship, covering our mouth to muffle our breathing, cowering at the bottom of the ocean, trying to distinguish rusty creaks from monstrous howling. It might also just be us questioning what's real and what's our imagination sabotaging us. The slow burn of rising intensity is always there flickering in the darkness. It's all about the slow feed of cortisol. This is a unique type of fear because effective psychological horror lives and dies on something called mental modeling. This is our mind's ability to create scenarios out of just a few scattered stimuli, sounds, shadows, background information. It's why the unseen will always be the scariest thing to us. The absence of information naturally triggers our brain to fill in the holes, and our fearful brains will always piece together the scariest thing it can conjure if we have very little to go on. These types of games do best when withholding as much information as possible without leaving us completely in the dark. The creative director of Frictional Games, Thomas Grip, uses this concept to his advantage whenever he designs the horrors in Soma or Amnesia. For him, a level's horror should always come from the environment and sound design first, and the actual threats Second, we may catch a glimpse at the end of a corridor or hear distant shrieks before entering an area. Take this level from Soma, for example. I know, we're talking about Soma again. We enter through this duct where we've already gotten a taste of some sound design telling us this next portion will be dangerous. And if that wasn't enough, we come across a dead crew member some very vivid gore, and evidence of an escaped creature. What kind of beast could have done all of this? It doesn't look very friendly, that's for sure. So when the lights go off, and we hear hulking footsteps echoing through the metal hallways behind us, we know we're in trouble. We have no concept of what this creature might look like or how it might move. So our imagination takes hold. The darkness could be hiding a vicious monstrosity with gnashing fangs or a hulking mass of hungrily undulating flesh. We have no idea. I won't spoil what this creature looks like for you because that's the downfall of psychological horror games. Once you know what the creature looks like, it can never be as scary as what your brain dreamt up for you. 
The fear of the unknown will always win, but if a psychological horror game relied on a player's mental modeling and nothing else, it would fall apart pretty quickly. The buildup during these games is definitely the emphasis, but the release is still important to maintain your tension going forward. If you never encounter any danger, you'll slowly begin to write off the sound design and carefully crafted environments as hollow decorations. For great examples of payoff, we can look at action horror, the dopamine-drenched side of the horror gaming equation. When players want heart-pounding fights against overwhelming odds, this is the subgenre for them. It's less about a slow building sizzle and more about the red-hot explosion. Back on the psychological horror side of things, if you're spotted, you usually have no way to recover other than hiding and hoping. In action horror, you get to fight back against whatever is terrorizing you, or at the very least, escape it after a sweaty chase across the rooftops. The gameplay experience might feel a bit more rewarding for this reason too. The main difference is how the player is equipped to deal with these climactic moments. Faster movement speeds than your enemies, maybe an endless arsenal to deal with hordes of zombies. If you keep your wits about you, you'll almost always stand a chance even if it seems like the odds are stacked against you. You just need to face the horde head on, looking your fear of being overwhelmed directly in the eyes, or making it to safety in time before being able to catch your breath. But how do these games remain scary? When done right, action horror still gives you that build up and release dynamic. But the release tends to be a lot more pronounced while the build up is fairly short. In games like Little Nightmares or Dying Light, chase sequences can often get our heart racing despite the fact that we aren't the ones running. It's our avatars doing the footwork. You also see a similar phenomenon in a game like Left 4 Dead 2. You may hear the telltale signs of a witch a few moments before you see her weeping in the corner. You and your party know to tread carefully, because the second you startle her, things can turn sour really quickly. I'm just now realizing this subgenre has a lot of zombies, huh? Weird. But if we take away that ability to fight back or run, we dive into the opposite end of the pool with survival horror. A survival horror game might still contain plenty of action, but rather than empowering the player with a plethora of rocket launchers and vehicles, they do everything in their power to make the gameplay experience a disempowerment fantasy. Your ammo might be threatening to run dry at any time. You may not have the space to carry everything you need. Here, things that you might be used to in most video games are taken away, leaving you feeling vulnerable in stressful situations. The odds are often stacked against you, and you often have to think about things like finding food, drinking clean water, and sleeping to stay alive, on top of everything else that's out to tear you limb from limb. Success in survival horror depends on what Dr. Ken Carter calls emotional regulation. He's a clinical psychologist who studies stress and fear through video games and other activities, by the way. What a cool job, right? Emotional regulation is our ability to step back and take control of our anxieties when presented with stressful circumstances. If we're struggling to hit the right button while being chased and low on ammo, that's survival horror challenging our sense of emotional regulation. If you can stay resourceful in the face of fear, you'll do well though. More than likely, the game will constantly throw things at you to make your experience as demanding as it can. Will you need that alcohol for a healing item or should you craft a molotov to defend yourself? Do you risk wasting your few bullets on this enemy or damn, time for the knife, I guess. Well, at least now you're safe in this room, right? Better look over your shoulder again, just to make sure though. You're never really safe in survival horror. Classics in the genre make sure that we never feel too comfortable or overpowered. We have to treat each bullet like it's our last, because it really might be. Nothing is more chilling than seeing that your weapon is out of ammo and there's none to be found anywhere. The real test of our emotional regulation comes when we have to make a plan with limited resources while knowing the dangers that are ahead.
Stripping it all back and looking at the basics of fear, we find our brain's most basic and visceral reactions. Phobias. Most people have a couple of serious phobias that cause them extreme panic or stress. So often when they come across these phobias in video games, it'll quickly turn into a horror game, whether or not the creators intended for that to happen. So while for most, a game like Subnautica wouldn't be a horror game, for me, someone with thalassophobia, it's definitely horror first and survival sim second. Clearly, when devs design entire games around exploiting phobias, players with that phobia are in for quite the terrifying playthrough. But games like this can actually be a really valuable experience for those players too. Video games often get used in self-administered exposure therapy to help cope with phobias. When professionally administered, exposure therapy created to deal with specific fears and anxiety disorders has been found to greatly reduce symptoms in 60 to 90% of patients. And one of the most accessible methods of exposure therapy is virtual reality. In this case, video games. In fact, many recent studies have found virtual reality exposure therapy to be equally as effective as in vivo, which basically has subjects confront their fears in real life. This just goes to prove that when a video game is really well designed and makes us suspend our disbelief, it can be just as frightening as the real thing. So if you're looking to confront your fear of the darkness, video games might just be the best option. Although I will admit the deep dark ocean still freaks me out no matter how many times I dive into it in Subnautica. There are so many great horror games that exist without a cheap startle in sight, so when those startles do crop up, it almost feels like a letdown. Like the creators weren't sure how to build any meaningful tension within the world they constructed. When really, horror is the dark figure at the end of the hallway, staring at us without moving. It's the sweat dripping off our forehead as we run for safety. It's the dread that burrows its way to the root of our imagination and doesn't let go. Especially when your brain is in a space where it can suspend its disbelief. It can make the experience much more intense, but also make that relief after the fact a lot more euphoric as well. Given the right story, sound design, and gameplay elements, any game can make us feel like we're part of that world, and any game can chill us to the core. <laughs> Boo! It's my face. How's that for a jump scare? <laughs> Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate it. I put a lot of work into these videos. So if you enjoyed it, please go ahead and hit the like button, share the video, subscribe to the channel. I make new videos like this on the first Saturday of every single month. Also, what's your favorite horror game? It can be something popular, something indie, something that I've never heard of. I've been looking for more horror games to play over on my Twitch. So uh, if you have any suggestions, leave them below. Link to my Twitch is down in the description, as well as all the credits for the video, all the music that I used, all the games that we featured, everything. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you in next month's video essay. Bye!